you happen to be in the world and welcome to the essentials of accelerated experiential dynamic psychotherapy. Uh, my name is John Olstead and I'm a business manager uh, coming to you from the PESI World Headquarters in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And I am really pleased to be here today with Natasha Pren and Carrie Gleiser, two senior faculty members of the AEDP Institute. And we're here to talk about our new course that we're launching together, The Essentials of AEDP, and, uh, and give you an idea today about uh, what it's about and how it can work in your practice. So Natasha and Carrie, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Great to be here. Very so uh, I kind of wanted to start off the bat, I think, that because ADP is kind of, a, I think, a, a newer modality for some folks. Um, if you wouldn't mind t talking to, uh, you know, about yourselves and your practice and what are the key elements of ADP and, and kind of what drew you into a ADP in your world? Sure, absolutely. Do you want to start, yeah. Natasha? I'd love to start, yes. Um, so um, what drew me to ADP? Well, seeing... The work of Diana Foschel live on video, um, I think in 2004, made me think, oh, that's how you really help people. And it was, in fact, her radically relational approach, where her use of herself explicitly saying how to be an attachment therapist made me, my, you know, my heart leap and think, oh, that's how you help people. Everyone's always talking about, you know, the relationship is what cures and uh, attachment is everything. And then this was the first place that I found that explicitly says and unpacks in detail, mm -hmm. intervention by intervention, how you actually use yourself explicitly mm -hmm. to heal uh, everything, including and specifically for this course, trauma. What about you, Carrie? That's the start, it's, right? Yeah, it's yeah. a very similar story. I was nodding as you were speaking, because I think that's how a lot of people come to AEDP is... Yeah that we teach a lot through showing video. So the work really comes alive. It's not kind of abstract or, I mean, it's, it is very theoretical and very, in some ways abstract, but the teaching is very moment to moment and hands-on by showing videotape. So I saw Diana present and I absolutely lit up inside and I thought, this is the kind of therapist I wanna be because she really demonstrated through her tape how how there can be a methodology and a process around being relational and how you can be very intentional to use it, not sacrificing authenticity and deep presence, but also being very mindful about how you're using interventions to reach people, to undo aloneness, which is one of the key pillars of AEDP, um, how you use the relational experience in the moment with your client to undo aloneness and to create emotional bravery. That was the other thing that stood out to me was the emotional bravery to go to really big affect, really deep feelings from the very first session in order to facilitate healing. Yeah. Wonderful. And, and now help me, I, I think, I'm curious about what the key elements are in ADP, right? Is it part somatics, some parts work? Mm -hmm. attachment. Can you talk a little bit about what, what that blend is in AEDP? Yeah, all of the above for sure. <laughs> right, we'll right. Start and then please Natasha chime in because yeah. There, yeah. there are a bunch of, I would say, pillars that kind of support AEDP as a therapy. One is definitely somatic, as you said, um, but I would say more broadly, it's experiential. We're, we're looking to help people quickly get out of their story and out of their head and down into experience. So whether that experience is somatic, relational, emotional, and often all of the above, mm -hmm. we want to help people be in their lived experience to track it, to help it move through a full wave of processing and, and trusting that, that that experience itself and spe specifically the emotional aspects of that experience are deeply transformational. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. And I'm doing aloneness all the time. I mean, the theory, I think the main pillar of the theory that I, that I hold close at all times is to explicitly undo unbearable aloneness as one works somatically, as one works emotionally, as one works with parts, and we're gonna talk more about that today. And so I'm, I'm doing the aloneness. And so I always love presenting with somebody because I always think that it's a very, in fact, unbearably alone thing 
to present or come to one of these alone. And, you know, just to give you all a little taste of, of ADP, you know, just I love working with Carrie and that's something in ADP that I would make explicit, you know, as a therapist, you don't have to hide in ADP. You can say, Carrie, I'm so pleased to see you and be here with you. And then I would explore that just as carefully as I think other therapies explore what feels bad or difficult. We try to explore what feels good and relational and perhaps harnessing a new experience uh, in each moment. So, you That's know, I would say to Carrie, what's it like to know that I'm so glad to see you? You know, a simple self-disclosure and then always seeing how something lands. Um, yes. Yes. And then tracking that experience. So you ask me how it is, yeah. and I'll answer you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Typically, having you here with me, I feel these kind of little leaps of excitement about what we're doing mm -hmm. in general. But I also feel like a little more settled than I think yeah. I would if, if I were up here by myself. There's a yeah. kind of, there's just a little almost like layer of safety yeah. that like makes me yeah. feel more comfortable in my body. My shoulders are kind of dropped. I'm not like yeah. tense and leaning forward and feeling yeah. like I'm on stage, right? I'm yeah. feeling like I'm in relationship mm -hmm. and that you and I share something really, um, really deep, you know, yes. with, with our relationship and with yeah. our love for ADP. And so those two yeah. things come together and they just create a really lovely feeling being here and mm -hmm. sharing it with everyone. Mm -hmm. that, in and doing yes. that together also feels really good yeah and again just to give a little tiny bit more of a taste there was a moment when you sort of said looked down and got a little serious which would be a moment to moment tracking for me that I didn't need to remark on and as you settled we talk a lot about dyadic affect regulation and the dyad the two of us and the three with John who we now know very well so it's lovely mm -hmm. to have John too you know I could feel you know, oh, you're settled, now I'm a bit more settled, and it goes back and forth. And that's what we call dyadic affect regulation, and it's our nervous systems explicitly getting in sync together. And I think that that is another real tenet of AEGP that one doesn't mm -hmm. see, I, I don't wanna do a, other therapies don't, but you know, the specific mm -hmm. to ADP, you know. And yeah. unique to ADP. Yes, yes. Um, because we don't just let it happen. I think it probably happens in a lot of different therapies implicitly, but the way we use it. So that moment when I took that deep breath and I felt the settling, it was because I was attuning to myself and my own experience and I was attuning to you and we were naming it and I was paying attention to it. And so it let me just sink into it more deeply than if we hadn't named it and if we hadn't paid attention to it. So I think we're trying to entrain people's natural processes and responses. Yeah. And either you can think of it as amplifying them or deepening. I think both yeah. work depending on yeah. the experience. And by doing that, we're really helping to draw out the body's inner natural healing capacity. And in AEDP, we call that transformance, right? That there is this inborn drive toward mm -hmm. healing, growth, connection. It may get um, obscured. It may get covered up. It may have to go into hiding because of trauma, but it's in there. And we're always searching for it. We're always looking for it. We're always kind of trying to capture the glimmers of it in, in really tender ways and kind of draw it out and let that lead. Sure. I um, And before we move forward, I want to greet everyone out there and across a lot of social media platforms and I'd love to see the all the, the hellos coming. Um, any of you out there in the audience, please put your questions in and at the end of the session here, we'll, uh, we'll get to some of those. So, um, Coming back to, uh, like, Carrie, what you talked about, you know, like how ADP is different from other therapies. Um, can you can you go a little more with that, like comparing, contrasting to like what some other more common uh, modalities might be, like IFS, for example, or something like that? Mm -hmm. And maybe um, talk to us a bit about how um, or what are the challenges for a therapist who's new to AADP and maybe a little bit on how our course will help to address that and, and help folks on their own journey to learn this. Sure. Let me start out with what 
are some of the other elements that I find unique to AADP. Um, like we said, it's an experiential therapy, which means we're trying to get people in touch with experience. And I think there are many experiential therapies out there, right? Any kind of um, somatic therapy, even IFS can be quite experiential. Um, but one of the things that AADP really adds is this idea of extending the therapeutic relationship into that experiential process, right? So whatever's happening between me and my client is fair game, right? To, to harness, to talk about, we have this phrase in AADP, we make the implicit explicit, we make the explicit experiential, we make the experiential relational, and we make all of that transformational, right? So what does that mean? So I'll give you an example. I was sitting with a patient of mine the other day who just really spontaneous, spontaneously let out this peal of laughter, right? And this is someone who had not had a lot of access to joy in recent years because she had been struggling with so much trauma. And I felt this kind of wave of delight come over me hearing her just unimpeded peal of laughter. And I said to her, I said, I feel so much joy hearing that burst of laughter, right? So I said it, I made it explicit. And then I said to her, what's it like to hear me say that, right? What happens inside of you? So that's making it experiential. And she said, and she, her eyes filled up with tears. And she said, it means so much to me that you see that. And it means so much to me that my joy is coming back into my life. So we spent a lot of time with her just deepening into the relational experience of being seen and appreciated for that joy and that laughter. Right? It would have been very easy just to have a little burst of happiness and then say, okay, now what are we going to do in therapy? Right. Yes. But that became the therapy. So we really then descended into the shoot of that experience, that positive experience. And where did it lead? It led to, wow, I could never express joy as a child. It would always be crushed. Nobody wanted me to have joy. No one wanted me to be loud. The fact that you see my loud joy and that you love it is so different. So then she went into her attachment trauma, right? Of right. being crushed and being not seen, being neglected, yeah. being abused. But the access was through this very real relational experiential moment that happened between us. So I think learning to recognize those moments and learning to recognize the value of them in AEDP is one of the deeply unique and deeply relational and deeply authentic aspects of AEDP. I also think it's one of the challenging ones, right? Because in therapy, you know, trainings, many different kinds of trainings, we get taught to focus on the negative, to focus on psychopathology, right, to focus on technique, to maybe not show up fully with our very full emotional relational selves. And so in a way, breaking some of these old messages and learning that showing up fully and authentically in the service of healing is actually one of our most powerful tools in the service mm -hmm. of our patient's healing process. Can, can I just add, you know, people sometimes get overwhelmed by AEDP, accelerated experiential dynamic psychotherapy. What is that? And I always really love focusing in on that there used to be a hyphen between experiential dynamic. Through the experience, as Carrie just said, we get into the dynamics, mm -hmm. you know, the history, the maladaptive cycles. We have this moment, Carrie has this moment of joy. They have joy together. They explore it as carefully as you might have explored something negative in other therapies. And through that, very often having something good brings up all the dynamics of not having, and we call that mourning the self in AEDP. Mm -hmm. and, and it's through the experience relationally in each moment, trying to give a new good experience uh, that we get into the dynamics. And so I think it's really helpful to really hone in on what does experiential dynamic mean? Um, yes. And I hope that that's clear because that's what we're always in a way doing, um, hoping that through the experience and actually trusting that through the experience and the dynamics will come to the fore. I've never had anyone do that before. Well, what's it like that I'm doing it with you now? New, mm -hmm. good experience, comparison to the old, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I never have. Well, but right here, right now with me, we are, you are, right? 
So absolutely. And you said yeah. a question in there that I just want to yeah. emphasize, which is what's it like to do this with me? Yeah. And that's an example of meta processing, right? We're asking someone, what's it like to have this experience with me? And that's another really unique element of AEGP. So AEGP is a four state model. And just really briefly, we get into this much more deeply in the course. Um, but the, the very sparest of overview is that people come in in a state of defense or stress, right? Things aren't working. And we try and help them move into authentic emotional experience, somatic experience, relational experience. That's state two, being in touch with open experience. When you help somebody have a wave of adaptive emotional experience, say they have a wave of grief or they have a wave of rage and it gets fully expressed, moves through the body, they come out to the other side. In ADP, that's not the end. And in a lot of experiential therapies, that's the end, right? We did the emotional processing. Well, let's wrap up for the day. But in ADP, that's what, you're only halfway there. It's really the beginning of something new and powerful, which it happens in state three and state four, which is we continue to stay in touch with the experience. And then it becomes about the experience of transformation. So what are the breakthrough affects? What are the breakthrough feelings? People feel relief. They feel lighter. They feel more connected. They feel grateful. Maybe they feel a sense of awe about what they just did. Maybe they feel a little kind of, tingly uncertainty about what is this big thing that I never thought I'd do in my whole life, right? ADP tracks that phenomenology moment by moment and encourages people to stay in touch with it. So it comes out into these big moments of connection to self, connection to other, connection to truth, truth about the self, adaptive action tendencies, right? Like what you need to do in the service of your own healing process, your own life, right? You don't have to make lists of, of how to cope or things that you might need to do to make life better. It just becomes this deep sense of connection and knowing internally. So there's a lot of magic that happens in ADP states three and four, and we really get into that in great detail in some of the later modules and show videotape of work in state three and state four because it's just where you mine the gold of all that work of undoing aloneness and processing deep emotion. Yeah, it's one of the things I appreciate about the work that you two did in the course is having those demonstrations are very important because this is a different way of working. And so um, it, it helps to bring it to life for folks because um, coming back to your laughter comment, Carrie, that was one thing I wondered about for someone is how do you know, because every one of those moments can carry such depth, as you pointed out, that you don't know where one of these, a laugh is not just a laugh, you know. Right. Um, how do you know in which moment to choose or what, when to follow that path with someone? That's a great question. And I wish I had a definitive answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could go back to little choice points and see what happened if I went the other way. Because you're right, they're kind of infinite possibilities and infinite choice points. There's this wonderful um, short story, this fantastical short story by Georges-Louis Borges called The Garden of Forking Paths, which basically is each moment in our life is a forking path in the garden, right? Where you can go many different ways and have many different outcomes. And I think of ADP a little bit like that, except it's not just based on chance that we're really tracking carefully. So if my patient, if I had said to her, what's it like that I, I re responded to your laugh like this, that I, I heard your laugh and it created this moment of joy in me. If she had said, uh, it's fine, you know, and then went on to talk about something else and I didn't think she was blocking something that it really just wasn't a big deal to her, I would be tracking, okay, we'll go on to the next thing and we'll wait for a focus to make itself clear. But I think we, we use our own intuitive um, internal tracking as well. And something in me said, this is important. Something in me lit up. And it's not always 100% accurate. But if you're attuned to your client, if you're really in touch and you're attuned to yourself, usually you can trust those little, those little inner tugs. And it said to me, this is important. 
focus on this. Let her see that you see her this way and that she's having a positive impact on you. Because I also think that for people that have had a deep attachment trauma, an essential part of their healing process is knowing that they matter to another, knowing that they can impact another, knowing that they exist for another. And so by using self-disclosure and using my experience as a therapist, I'm saying to her, without words, I'm, I'm living with her, right? That I'm here, I'm engaged, you have my full attention, heart and mind, and it's all in the service of your healing. And that's a really powerful entrainment, right? That's a really powerful energy to be in with someone. Absolutely. Natasha, anything you want to add to what Carrie said? Or... Um, just, just the making it all explicit is so, it's fun. I mean, the thing that is so sort of peculiar about AEDP um, and why I think it suits me as a therapy is that you have these really spontaneous, authentic moments that you can make explicit and they tend to be full of positive energy. That happened to be a, a joyful one, but it's the same with a spontaneous, oh, I'm so angry on your behalf. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a fun, energizing, bite, bite, you know, vital kind of therapy. Um, mm -hmm. and, and as a therapist, you don't have to hide. You're constantly tracking how you're doing dyadically with your client and you can share it. And I think that that's very relaxing. Mm -hmm. um, not that we don't have our left brain smarts. And, you know, the thing I love also about AEDP is, you know, such a detailed theory, uh, methodology and m maps and triangles. You get to meet lots of different um, maps and uh, you know, state maps, city maps, um, subway maps. <laughs> Um, we know where we're going um, uh, in AEDP, and we often we really teach you to know what you're looking at um, yes. and where certain interventions will most likely go if the work is on track and going well. There are markers mm -hmm. of the transformational mm -hmm. process that are reliable in people because we're designed to heal. We're designed for health and healing, and AEDP believes that we have everything already inside um, yeah. to heal. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I would want to add. Wonderful. Um, so you, you've already hit on so many of these examples, but if you can talk a little bit more about how ADP, you know, is a, why is this such a, a good therapy for trauma? Mm -hmm. And, um, and related, I'm going to add in, cause I see we have a question here uh, as well. Um, you know, why is it, why is it good for trauma therapy? Um, is it applicable to other kinds of patients or situations? Um, and maybe head on like what some exceptions would be where maybe ADP might not be the best choice if, mm -hmm. if there is such a thing. Sure. There are a few questions embedded in that. I would say ADP was designed as a general therapy kind of, it wasn't just designed as a trauma therapy, but over the years we've come to realize how amazing it is for attachment trauma, complex trauma even dissociative disorders. I work a lot with more severe spectrum dissociative disorders. Um, and some of the elements that we've already talked about, the dyadic processing, the dyadic regulation, right? The undoing aloneness, right? To help with these really big waves of emotion that people have been too scared to approach on their own, right? So this idea of we're doing it together, what you haven't been able to face or hold together because it was too overwhelming, we can hold together. And also the using the attachment experience and the relational experience, attachment's one of those maps that we get really good at recognizing in the moment, attachment dynamics. We get to use the relationship, the therapeutic relationship to really actively restructure attachment and work with it explicitly in the room. And I think that's a really powerful tool. And finally, there is a parts model for AEDP that I developed um, with one of my other colleagues who's not here today, Jerry Lamagna, called interrelational uh, theory or interrelational uh, interventions. And that looks at how we take all that we've talked about so far, all of the relational, experiential, somatic um, pillars of AEDP. And instead of just thinking about that, on a one dimensional field, like between the patient and the therapist, we expand that and we say, there are actually many axes in the room, right? If someone 
has disowned, dissociated material, right? I have a whole attachment relational field with my patient and with what they've dissociated. And they have a whole relational experiential field between them and what they've dissociated. And so we can really work on all these different axes. We can work experientially, we can work relationally, we can work with attachment on all these different axes. So I can do a relational intervention with my patient, or I can do a relational, inter relational intervention with a dissociated young part of my patient, right? Or I can lead my patient in doing an experiential encounter with a dissociated part of themselves. And all of those can be reparative and healing. And in fact, how we use those different fields and those different axes to craft our experiential interventions is yet another map and another kind of informed decision-making process. And in fact, one that I think patients respond really deeply to because there can be this um, caution and I understand why it's there, but I think it's a little bit of a, maybe over-exaggerated caution about therapists dealing with patients' parts and interacting with patients' parts. And I think if you don't have a map and you don't have a way of, of carefully crafting interventions given someone's attachment style, that can be risky. But when you do have the right map, it can be right. deeply healing. Yeah. Because imagine a patient who comes from a history of neglect, right? And they get the message, implicit or explicit. I think you as a grown-up can do all this work inside. And in fact, I, I'm going to be here and I'm going to help you do all this work with your parts inside, right? How similar is that message to messages of neglect? I, I'm not really going to get involved. I'm not going to get near those little parts. Just like parents never got near them, teachers never got near them. They were always invisible to everyone else. Well, you're going to see them, but I'm going to continue to keep my distance, right? In a way, we can kind of inadvertently reenact those same conditions, whereas in ADP, in the interrelational model, if it is... Um, if it seems prescribed and okay, and we, we, I talk more about this in the course, I might have an imagined interaction with that young part, with that young neglected part, right? Because that's a relational repair. That's a corrective emotional experience that was never had in that patient's history. And that can be very healing. Relational trauma needs relational repair. And being able to do that in an informed way with patients' parts and help them do it with their own parts, right? It's definitely their complementary approaches. I'm doing this because the interrelational map is a triangle. <laughs> like Natasha said, we're going to present many triangles in the course. Uh, it really gives people the tools to do that in a, in a, in a careful therapeutic way. Great. I, um, I see our time is going very fast here. I, and I'm wondering before we maybe take a couple of questions, if you'd like to do any kind of demonstrations for us or model this a little bit, let us get an idea of what, what it's about. We can do another one. Sure. We can do another one. I mean, I feel like we did a little bit in the beginning, yeah. right? a little yeah. bit in the beginning. Um, but you know, if you, you're meeting a, a patient for the first time and you, you know, Hello, how how are you? Right, and you got Carrie would say whatever you would say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how are you? if I'm if I'm coming in with defenses, I'll say something like, "Fine." Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right? Maybe a little guarded and not so sure how this go yet. Right. Right. And I might say, "What's well, fine?" You know, I'm so glad you're fine, and we're just getting to know each other. What's What's fine? Fine, like inside. Just check in. And I'll do it too. I'll check in with myself too. And then just wait. And what, you know, what's it like inside the fine, Carrie? So if, if, if I'm being partially me and partially the, this role play patient, <laughs> yeah. I do notice a shift when you say, I'm going to check in with myself too, because that already, you're modeling a certain vulnerability and a certain willingness to be vulnerable and to be here and be engaged. So I felt again something in me just unclench a little bit. So if 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 I'm a pretty somatically connected patient, I might say, "Well, I felt something unclench a little when you said that that you're going to check in with yourself too." Yeah, yeah. 
And so, I mean, then in ADP, we always affirm, you know, so that's so great that you notice that in yourself, mm -hmm. right? And what's it, what's it like inside now? And, and again, I'm going to keep checking in and you keep checking in and we'll check in how we're doing together. How is that? Yeah. Well, and You're just doing great. your voice has changed and gotten yeah. under, right? Yeah. Right. That also. <laughs> yeah. Affects me. Mm -hmm. Right. I can hear it. I can feel you be here in a different way with me. And that makes me hopeful. Mm -hmm. right. I feel you as a person, right? right. Not just therapist right. who's taking notes on a clipboard right right and what's it like inside that hopeful i always say you know if there's an emotion laden word that's an entry yeah. point what's it like inside that hopeful you know well it's like it's hopeful that i can find somebody to be on this journey with me and feel kind of it feels accompanied and mm -hmm. it feels accompanied and like i want to move forward mm -hmm. so it's kind of like like energizing and like, okay, let's go. <laughs> let's go, right, right. And then, you know, I would want to match, you know, the let's go, I would be like, okay, you know, I feel like you're giving me the green light to roll up our sleeves, you know, yes. what's that like that I'm, I'm like, let's go too, you know. Yeah. So that would be an example when it goes really well, just for those yeah. out there who think, yeah, that never happens. But just, you know, <laughs> it, some, it actually sometimes does, which is amazing because <laughs> people are really, you know, people coming in for therapy because they want to change. Um, but, but sometimes, you know, if you, if, if, if my voice does get a little tender, people say, oh, you're not going to use that therapy voice with me, are you? And I'll say, oh, thank you so much for telling me. Oh yeah, no, I used to hate that too. You know, what's it like to know that? Oh yeah. Yeah. You can totally give me feedback and I'm, you know, yes. you know, or what happens inside when my voice is a little soft and tender, you know, I hate it, Blech. you know, it's ther therapy, syrupy or whatever people say, you know? But then you're into the work, right? Something's happening experientially, relationally. It's fun. I mean, it's I, I, real I, it's, too, it's right? Real, right? Yeah. It's real. You're not just in someone's repetitive story that they've, you know, That's if right. they've been in a lot of therapies that they've done over and over and over again, yeah. it, it, it's coming alive in the room. And when it comes yeah. alive, then you can roll up your sleeves and like get into it, right? Because it's happening yes. in front of you. And yes. that's what we want from a neurobiological perspective, right? We know um, through memory reconsolidation, through the, the, this theory of like, you have to open the neural networks in order to access them and make them different. And what makes right. them different is experience. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this little mini role play was like the first two minutes of a therapy session. So mm -hmm. it's also just to be explicit about it, we do ADP from the first moments. We don't yeah. do a whole multi-question assessment. We don't say we're going to get to know each other first and then we're going to get into the experience. We lead with the experience. So in that way, it is a kind of a brave, bold approach, but it's also almost surprising the unconscious of patients because it is, it does feel different from other therapies. Yeah. Thank you for doing a little more role playing. I appreciate it. I know I put you on the spot for a little no, more. I'm delighted. I, wanna... I love doing that. <laughs> yeah. You can do all day long. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. What's it like to hear that, John? That we're doing? Yeah. 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 Why we right. go anywhere with ADP? <laughs> Let's um let's take a couple of questions here and then we'll come to a close. Um, Nicole on LinkedIn wanted to know if this is considered a good approach for um, autism spectrum disorders and borderline traits. So someone uh, with ASD who, who scores high with those traits, is this a good therapy for them? Yeah, I, I mean, with modifications, absolutely. I think that one of the things about relational work, even though we may have emphasized the intimacy and getting closer and getting connected parts. I think we may not have emphasized as much how much you have to track what works and what doesn't work with your patient, mm -hmm. right? So if saying, can you look up at me and look in my eyes when you're feeling out of control, right? For someone that is on the spectrum, that might be very dysregulating. So I worked with someone once on the spectrum that I had to learn that and really own that while eye contact was regulating for me, it was deeply dysregulating for them. And so we did this whole piece of work where I said, I'm going to avert my gaze intentionally. I'm going to look down like this. And how is that for you? And, they, and their eyes filled up with tears and they said, 
Nobody does that for me. Everyone wants me to look in their eyes. Everyone thinks that it's that, you know, and, and really went on to process some of that pain of having to adapt to a world that doesn't always function in the way that they have functioned and how moved they were that I said, you know, it, it's hard for me, but I want to do this for you because I want to make it feel comfortable. And we ended up doing a lot of work actually sitting on the floor back to back, you know, that we found this after many iterations of what feels better for you. What, how can you feel me without feeling dysregulated? How can you feel me without feeling like it's too much while well, sitting face to face feels too vulnerable, feels too revealing. Well, what if we sit back to back? And that was magical because then they could feel my support. They could feel my presence, but they didn't have to look in my eyes. They didn't have to feel my gaze on them. And that was, it was really a beautiful discovery. Um, so that's one example I've had of working with someone on the spectrum, um, working with access to and you mentioned borderline personality disorder. I'm not big on labels. And I think a lot of people get shoved into kind of access to categories when really what they're having is really extreme trauma responses. And I even get a little hesitant about calling any of these things disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder, dissociative identity disorder, because I think they're all really normal reactions to trauma. And when we can hold that and work with it unflinchingly, you know, we, we, we work with whatever is in the room, but it's that non-pathologizing, understanding the genesis of, what, of, of a way of being or a behavior or a fear or a dysregulation. It can be really deeply witnessing and, and, and meaningful for people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, Hanane writes in, and this is a, a great comment and a, and a good way to come to a close here. Uh, just comments that uh, they feel that this is a, a cutting edge approach that emphasizes the power of therapeutic relationship of, as we've seen here and the healing potential of the body and emotions. And uh, felt that this webinar is a fantastic opportunity to learn from all of you. And, nice. uh, and <laughs> I would like to invite everyone to learn even more um, with a, a course that we have to offer you all. And it's the essentials of EDP. You see the example or the um, where to go to sign up. We open our course here January 23rd, so it's going to start very soon, and you're mm -hmm. going to have the opportunity to learn from Carrie and Natasha. Uh, we work through all the states, the essentials of AEDP. We talk about specializations for trauma treatment, and you also have the wonderful opportunity to interact with Carrie and Natasha with uh, five live 90-minute calls. So as you move through together in a group and uh, and take in all that there is to learn here. You can get your questions answered and interact with them along with your colleagues. So um, I invite you to, to sign up. The information is right here on your screen. Uh, before we go, Carrie and Natasha, I'll, I'll open up to you guys for any closing comments you'd like to share. Yeah, I think just that I'm really looking forward to having those moments of interaction and discussion because that's where the stuff really comes alive. Yeah. And in this, the training, Natasha and I worked really hard, even though our audience wasn't there, yeah. <laughs> right? We, we worked really hard to make it as interactional and as um, full of examples, clinical examples, role plays, videotapes. We tried to make it as interactional as we could in, in, in a one-sided way. And then the discussion groups and Q&As, those are really the moment where we can make this more relational, more accompanied, and really um, yield questions, hear where people are at, hear feedback. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yes, same here. And, you know, I just was looking, there's some great questions in the chat. I just do want to say that it's a researched evidence-based model at this point, And, you know, we'll be putting links up for that during the course. That was a great question. And um, I'm, we're so proud of a 16 session research study that we have more than one article out about that now um, for people to really, you know, everybody wants research and evidence-based and uh, we're thrilled that we are. So I just wanted to put a plug in there and that there were great questions that we didn't get to answer. So, you know, sign up and um, we'll look forward to meeting you in the 90-minute in the lives. I think it's going to be really fun. 
So thanks, John, for hosting us. Thanks, everyone, for coming in on all these different platforms. It's so fun to see where people are coming from. <laughs> yeah, Carrie and Natasha, thank you. And yes, and thank all of you for spending some time with us here today. And uh, we will see you in the course. I hope you all have a great weekend. Take care, everybody. Yeah, bye.